so grateful for your presence. We have a great number here today, and uh, that is due in large part to the number of visitors that we have. We want you to know that you are our honored guest, and we hope and pray that you'll come back and be with us here at the Adairsville Church of Christ at every opportunity that you have. Uh, please pick up a newsletter if you haven't done that yet from the foyer. There's a lot of information in there. Maybe that I won't have time to go over during our brief announcement period, uh, but it's so gl I'm so glad that you are here. This would be a good time to silence your cell phones if you haven't done that yet so that we're not disturbed by those ringing during our worship service. Just a few people on our prayer list. Um, continue to remember Brother Joe Jerome. Uh, he will likely have heart surgery in September. Uh, they think that that's the first opening they'll have to do that surgery. He'll have two heart valves repaired. And so remember Brother Joe DeRome as he gets ready for that surgery. It's great to see Brother Virgil's story here today. Uh, he has been recuperating from that surgery that he had to remove infection from his knee. And we'll be praying that he continues to get stronger every single day. Uh, also, Steve's sister, Susie Lentz, who is battling cancer uh, out in Texas. Uh, Lois Fletcher, who is able to be here this morning. We're grateful for her presence. She's fighting cancer as well. Uh, Jim O'Brien, who is a friend of Bonnie and Steve, who has stage four cancer as well. And so we pray for all of these and uh, pray that the Lord will bless them through his providence. Uh, also, it's so great to see Emmanuel George here. He is a missionary that we support in India, a great friend of the congregation here. We're so glad that he's able to visit from India for a little while. Uh, he'll be headed to PTP along with several thousand other faithful Christians this uh, this coming week. And so we'll be praying for him uh, as he's here in the States, traveling around to different churches and meeting different Christians and telling people about the great work that he's doing in India. So good to see him here. By the way, he'll be preaching for us tonight and uh, teaching Bible class on Wednesday night. So we're really looking forward to that. It's good to see Emmanuel George. Also, don't forget that Lunch and Learn meets tomorrow at the Annex at noon. That's where we have a lunch together and then uh, enjoy fellowship and a short Bible study as well. So come over if you can tomorrow at noon for Lunch and Learn in the Annex. Uh, let's see, I think that's everything that I have my list right now. If you have other things that you'd like to have announced, if you'll let me know. Uh, Brian is at the back with the emblems of the Lord's Supper in case anybody didn't pick them up on the way in. If you didn't get the emblems, if you'll raise your hand, he'll bring them by at this time. All right, I think that's everything that I have. We'll turn it over now to our song leader. Two hundred thirteen. Two hundred thirteen. <laughs>
851. Sing the first and last verses. Blue skies and rainbows and sun beams of heaven are what I can see. When my Lord is sitting in me, I know that Jesus is well and alive today. He may. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead and speaking. Bow with me, please. The most gracious heaven, Father, we come before thee, thank thee for this time, this opportunity. Have to gather together to sing songs of praise unto thee and hear no voice from thy word. Father, we pray that Brother Rick has studied this week to the extent that he can give us the lesson of one from thy word that we can apply those words to our lives and lead others unto thee. Father, we pray for all those that were mentioned this morning, those that were not, that are being seen after physicians that at some point in their care that uh, have grant them restoration to their ailments that they can be once again back to the fold here as well as other places. Father, we 
pray for all those that are sick and afflicted to pray that they be comforted. Father, we know that we do those things in this life that we stumble from time to time. We ask thy forgiveness of this. We pray that you be with each of us in the service that we open our minds and hearts that we can receive thy word. Father, be with us throughout this service. In this we pray in Jesus' name. Four hundred fifty two. Four hundred fifty two as we prepare for the Lord's stuff. I will A good number here this morning, including visitors. As we prepare to observe the Lord's Supper, I want you to think about a time when God actually said no to his own son, but while doing that, he was saying yes to you and me. Can you think of a time when that happened? Well, think about what happened in the Garden of Gethsemane. You remember that Jesus prayed fervently three times to his Father, saying, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. The cup we understand was the cup of suffering that he was about to endure by dying on the cross for our sins. Luke even says that Jesus on that occasion was under such stress 
that his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Luke 24, Luke 22, 44. However, in spite of this fervent prayer from Jesus, God said no. Which should remind us that uh, our prayers are not always answered the way we would like. Anyway, when God said no to Jesus, we need to realize that he was saying yes to us. Why? Because without the death of Jesus, now his willingness to accept his Father's will and endure that suffering and die on the cross, we had no means of saving ourselves. But with his death, a clear way was made available. As Jesus was dying on that cross, his enemies mocked him at one point, and they said he saved others. Himself he cannot save. I don't think they realized how true that was. As a matter of fact was, Jesus could not save himself and still save us. So he had to accept the Father's will, and of course, thankfully, he was willing to do that for which we should ever be grateful. So on this day and every Lord's Day, we commemorate that wonderful sacrifice that Jesus made. Let's give thanks. Father, we now realize the cross was the only way for us to be saved. Though you had to say no three times to your son, we recognize that you said yes to us. How thankful we are that Jesus was willing to die that horrible death on the cross for us. How thankful we are that he deferred to your will and said, not as I will, but as you will. At this time, we give thanks for this bread, which, emblematic, which is emblematic of your son's body. Bless us now as we partake. In Jesus' name, amen. Now for the fruit of the vine. Our Father, we're so thankful that we have these few moments every Lord's Day to put the things of this world out of our mind and to focus upon your son Jesus and the wonderful sacrifice he was willing to make on our behalf. We thank you, Father, that he was willing to accept cross and all that went with that. We're thankful and mindful at this time of the blood that was shed from that cross even before that when he was scourged, brutally beaten. We recognize too that that blood, without the shedding of that blood, there is no remission. And how thankful we are for the gospel and its power to save Whereupon we, in being baptized into Christ, are baptized into his death. And how thankful we are each Lord's Day that we can, make, can commemorate that death and remember that that blood was shed indeed for our sins. Bless us now as we partake of this fruit of the vine as it represents that blood shed for our sins. In Jesus' name.
that concludes. This is part of our worship, and uh, for convenience sake, we use this time also to uh, think about the material blessings that God has given us. We are richly blessed, and uh, I know that you know that, but it's appropriate at this time for us to give thanks. And the collection plate, as you probably observed by now, and you know it's in the foyer. If you have not uh, been, been able yet to uh, put your contribution there, you can do so on your way out. Let's give thanks now for uh, things that God has blessed us with. Father, we recognize that every good and perfect gift comes from thee, and that without thee we could not have life and breath and health and sunshine and rain and food and clothes and just so many material blessings that uh, we often take for granted. But we're also and especially thankful for the spiritual blessings that we have through your Son, Jesus. We pray, Father, that we ever, we ever recognize that and give thanks every day for these blessings and live in such a way that we can uh, give honor back to you by the way that we live. Bless us now in our giving and bless us as we use these funds to uh, further the work that you have given us to do in spreading the gospel and edifying one another and using what we have to help others in need. Bless us as we give. We ask in Jesus' name. Let's all stand and sing 824. 824. sing sound really good this morning as always we're grateful that you are here take your bibles if you will and open up to genesis chapter 3 most of the time that we have in our lesson today will be spent in genesis chapter 3 it's ever seem like that sometimes that this this world in which we live has a fascination with death i think about uh, artists who become famous many times after they die there's a movie in the theaters right now about Elvis. You know, a lot of people still claim they see Elvis around, that somehow he 
he faked his death and he's still really alive. There are people who will spend money to go to so-called psychics and people, mediums, who claim to be able to talk to the dead and to put people in touch with their loved ones who passed over on the other side. Sadly, all those people are shysters and fakes. You know, once our time here on this earth is over, we don't get to come back and talk to our loved ones anymore. A lot of people play on those uh, feelings of grief and because of their greed, end up fleecing those people, uh, bilking them out of their hard-earned money many times. You know, it is true, though, that Sometimes we can get messages from the dead. In uh, Hebrews chapter 11 that was read by Bert just a few minutes ago, the Bible talks about Abel and the fact that he was righteous upon the earth. The Bible says God, in the last part of that verse, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. And of course, that's not literal. The voice of Abel is not actually literally heard. But his example still speaks to us today. And so that's really the most important kind of messages from the dead that we receive. The examples, good and bad, of those who have gone on before us. The real question is, Will we listen to those messages and learn the lessons that we're supposed to learn? This morning I want to talk about some lessons that Adam and Eve teach us, though they are long dead. You know, the first man and woman that were created and placed in the garden, uh, they were preceded in death by their son Abel, but I suppose that uh, before long they followed suit. And eventually all of our time on this side of eternity is up and we all face death. They left behind a message by their example and we will too when we're gone. I want to look at Genesis chapter 3 though this morning and talk about some messages that we still get from Adam and Eve. So let's read a few verses here in Genesis chapter 3. Beginning in verse number 1, the Bible says, Now the serpent... The serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, and your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the uh, woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. You know, the first lesson I think we learned from Adam and Eve, from the dead, is that Satan's influence will still be encountered today. Now I know that in Genesis chapter 3, Satan took upon the form of the serpent. And he doesn't work that way today. A snake is not going to come slithering up to you and try to convince you to do evil. That's not the way he works today. But let me tell you that the devil is still alive. His purpose is still the same. And he still wants to destroy the souls of you and me in hell forever. The devil is still very real. And he is still after men today. His methods change, but not his goal. The Bible tells us today that he has many tools with which he can work. 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse number 11, the Bible says, Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. That's talking about the tools, the methods that God uses today to get into our hearts and minds the same way that he got into Adam and Eve's. 
God works uh, today through ministers, and so does the devil. The devil has messengers that will try to tempt us and, and trick us into doing things that are not in accordance with God's will, just like he did with Eve at first and later with Adam. 2 Corinthians 11, verses 14 and 15. The Bible says that no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. I want you to notice the, the point, really, that the Apostle Paul is making here in these verses by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He, what he says is, the devil does not appear to be wicked and evil and scary. It says he's transformed into an angel of light. And so if all you were depending on was the way the devil looks, you wouldn't be afraid of him. You would be maybe in awe of him as an angel of light. Many times throughout the Bible, when an angel appears unto men, they fall down on their faces because of the majesty of that order of God's created angels. And so the point he's making here is that the devil will fool you by the way he looks. And so it should be no surprise then, Paul writes, that his ministers will fool you too. Just as, the, just as the devil appears as an angel of light, his ministers can appear as messengers of righteousness. And so the devil doesn't look like a, you know, a red demon with horns and a pointy tail and a pitchfork. He looks like an angel of light. And many of his messengers then appear as messengers of righteousness. You see, the point that God is trying to make here to us is the devil is not what he seems. Neither are his ministers. They work their way in like wolves in sheep's clothing. They fool you by their appearance. And then they draw you away by their smooth words and fair speeches. And the Bible says that's how they deceive the minds of the simple. We've got to be on guard, don't we, against the old devil. Last week we studied a lesson about how he walks about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And his ministers are busy too. They're going to try to fool us, try to get us to compromise. And just like the devil did in Genesis chapter 3, change the word of God. Remember how Eve said we're not to eat of any of the, uh, we can eat of any fruit we want except the tree that grows in the midst of the garden. And if we eat of it, we'll die. And the devil said, thou shalt not surely die. He changed the word of God. He put doubt in the mind of Eve. That's the way he works in us too. He gets us to, to doubt what God has taught us. Doubt his word. If, if the devil can change his word, then he's God's. The devil is still very real, and his influence will still be encountered. Number two, we learn from Adam and Eve from the grave, is that God can still be disobeyed. You know, we saw the, the, uh, the sad verse here, verse number six, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave to her husband also. With her he did eat. What a tragedy that they broke God's laws. They teach us that God can still be disobeyed. You know, any law can be violated, can it? And sin is defined in God's word as the transgression of the law. 1 John chapter 3 and verse number 4, the Bible says, Whosoever commits sin transgresseth, uh, transgresseth the law, 
For sin is the transgression of the law. And so God gives men laws to live by, and men are expected to keep those laws, but when they transgress those laws, when they break the law, that is what is defined as sin. And boy, didn't Adam and Eve have it so easy? God created a perfect place for them, the Garden of Eden, and put them in there and basically said, this is all yours. You didn't have to work for it. You didn't have to plan it. You don't even have to uh, till it. All you have to do when you get hungry is go out there and pluck something off one of these multitude of uh, beautiful fruit trees that are always in season, and you'll have everything you need. Just don't eat of that one tree that grows in the midst of the garden. Every tree they saw they could eat of except one. That sounds easy enough to obey, doesn't it? But they gave in. They had it easy and they still fell. What about us? You know, a lot of ways we have it easy too, don't we? Jesus has already done the hard work. We don't have to die for our sins. He went to the cross of Calvary so that we could live. But we have to keep his law. We have to do what he says. None of us are going to be perfect. We're all going to break God's law. The Bible says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23. The Bible also says that sin, uh, that uh, the wages of sin is death, according to Romans 6 and verse number 23. And so... Sin can still be committed. God can still be disobeyed even today. And he is. All you've got to do is open your eyes and look around and you can see that this world is given over to sin. Many have even stopped putting up a pretense of obedience to God. Some deny that God even exists. God still expects to be obeyed. He is still our creator. He is still the one that made us. He has the right to tell us how to live. He has the right to lay out the plan that will get us from here to heaven. He's the one who created us. And yet still, like Adam and Eve, so many in this world are turning their backs on God. God's word can still be disobeyed. Number three, we learn from Adam and Eve that we must still give account of our actions to God. Let's continue to look here in this, uh, in this passage in Genesis chapter 3. The Bible says, in beginning in verse number 8, they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou was naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. You know, I don't know exactly, exactly what Adam and Eve thought were, uh, was going to happen when they ate of that forbidden fruit. But the Bible does say that their eyes were opened, and I think what that means is they realized for the very first time what it was like to disobey God, because up until that time they hadn't. They realized the weight of sin, the guilt of sin, and they, for the very first time, looked upon themselves with shame. The Bible says, of course, that they made themselves aprons of fig leaves to cover their nakedness. That wasn't good enough for God. He later made them skins of animals 
to cover themselves fully. Garments that, that cover their nakedness appropriately. And by the way, those innocent animals that died to give them those clothes that they wore, I think point the way to Jesus, the innocent giving his life for the guilty. Those animals didn't do anything to deserve to die, but man needed coverings. And so God sacrificed those animals on that occasion, just like he would do later with his son on the cross of Calvary. The innocent paying the price for the guilty. But Adam and Eve hid themselves as if you can hide from God. Can you imagine Adam and Eve crouching down, hiding in the bushes, thinking they pulled the wool over God's eyes? God was the one who created the universe. He's the one who, who created Adam and Eve, made Adam from the dust of the ground and made Eve from the rib of Adam and gave them their very lives. You can't hide from God. And when God said, where are you, Adam? It wasn't because he didn't know. God knows everything. He wanted Adam to think about his own plight there hiding in the bushes from God because of his own sins. God expects obedience and he demands accountability. Adam needs sin and now he's going to call them to the carpet as it were and ask them questions about their sins. Judgment happens with God face to face. It happened with Adam in the garden, and it'll happen for us on the day of judgment. You don't get to live any way you want to and get off scot-free. We will give account to God for our actions. Adam and Eve did, didn't they? The Lord said, what have you done? What have you done? You know, the first thing they tried was excuses, didn't they? Adam said, the woman that you gave me made me do it. She gave me of the fruit of that tree, and I ate of it. You know, that's almost kind of a sneaky way of blaming God, isn't it? Oh, Adam was pretty slick. He said, first of all, it was the woman's fault, not mine. And second, it was kind of your fault because you gave me the woman, and she gave, me, she gave it to me. Adam, you know whose fault it really is? It's yours. You chose to sin. You bear the consequences for that. He said to the woman, why have you done it? And she blamed it on the devil. Oh, the serpent came to me and tricked me into it. Excuses won't work. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 14, verse number 12, so then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. You know, the Bible pictures here really a beautiful scene where God had previously been walking with Adam and Eve in the cool of the garden and spending time face to face with them as his beloved children. But now they're in sin. Now they have sin to answer for. Now for the first time, they are afraid of God because of their own sins. Every one of us is going to give account of ourselves to God too. One day we're going to be face to face with God and he's going to ask us questions just like he asked Adam and Eve. Why have you done this? Why did you make the choices you made in your life when I gave you every opportunity? I laid the path out to heaven for you and I sent my own son Jesus to die on the cross for you. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse number 10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Excuses didn't work for Adam and Eve. They're not going to work for us either. We're going to have to give account of our sins. Adam and Eve teach us that. And then finally we learn from Adam and Eve that sin 
still has its consequences, doesn't it? What a terrible scene here uh, in the garden. Verse number 14, the Lord God had said to the serpent, because thou hast done this, done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and thus shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow. Uh, and thy conception in sorrow they shall bring forth uh, thou shalt bring forth children and thy desire shall be to thy husband and he shall rule over thee and unto Adam he said because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife and hast eaten of the tree which I commanded thee saying thou shalt not eat of it cursed is the ground for thy sake in sorrow thou shalt eat all the days of thy life thorns and thistles Shalt thou, shalt it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat of the herb of the field, in the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat thy bread, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it thou wast taken, thou art, for dust thou art, and for dust thou shalt return. And Adam called his wife, uh, his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. And unto Adam and also to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us, to know good and evil, now lest he put forth his hand, and take also the tree of life, and eat, and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east, at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims, and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. The terrible consequences of Adam and Eve's sin. He said to Eve, you're going to suffer in childbirth. Your desire is going to be your husband. And he's going to rule over you. He said to Adam, now you've been used to plucking this fruit and, and eating it with no work at all. But from here on out, you're going to work. You're going to work the ground that brings forth thorns and thistles. And by the sweat of your brow, you're going to earn your living from the ground. Farming is hard work. And it's that way because of Adam and Eve's, uh, because of Adam and Eve's sins. And maybe the worst consequence of all, they were cast out of that place that God had prepared for them. Thrown out of the garden of paradise, the garden of Eden. God placed guards there, cherubim, and a flaming sword to keep them out forever so they couldn't have the tree of life. Sin entered into the world because of Adam and Eve, and because sin entered into the world, death entered into the world. And it wasn't until Christ came, thousands of years later, that there was a cure for sin and for death. There are consequences for sin. There still are today. If we fall for the lies of the devil like they did, we could lose a lot more than just the Garden of Eden. That was just a temporary loss. They were cast out of the garden and lived the rest of their lives outside the garden. We could lose eternity if we believe the lies of the devil. If we fall for his schemes and bow our will to his, we'll be separated from God forever because of our sins. Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2, the Bible says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that he cannot save, neither is ear heavy that he cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Sin separates between us and God. And if we believe the devil and his lies, if we give in to him, then we will be separated from God for all eternity. That's what the Bible calls the second death. The worst thing about hell is not the fire and flames and the evil people there. The worst thing about, uh, about hell is that God is not there. And it lasts for eternity. 
Adam and Eve teach us that sin still has consequences. Aren't you thankful, though, that God has provided a plan for us? He's given us a way to avoid the eternal consequences of our sinful actions. If you're not a Christian today, we would plead with you to become a child of God because that's the only way to take care of sin God's way. Man has tried lots of different ways and none of them work. You can try to sweep it under the rug or pile up good deeds on top of sins or just ignore it, hope it'll go away or the time will take care of it. None of that will work. The only thing that will forgive sins is the blood of Jesus. The way we come in contact with that blood is through obedience to the gospel plan of salvation. Hear the word of God. Believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Have enough faith to repent of your sins. Come forward confessing the name of Christ and then being immersed in water for the remission of your sins. That's called the gospel plan of salvation. If you want to know more about that plan, come forward when we sing this song of encouragement. Let us know you want to study. and We'll help you learn everything you need to obey the gospel before you leave this place. If you're here as a Christian, you realize maybe you haven't been listening to the messages of people like Adam and Eve. You, maybe you've done like them and gone into the ways of sin. You can come back to repentance and prayer. And if we can pray with you and for you today, we'd be happy to help you. The elders are here to receive you. We're here to pray with you and for you. We'll do everything that we can to restore you back to the faithful fold. But you have to take the first step. And let us know of your need. We'll help you in any way that we can as together we stand and as we sing. I